Thanks and good morning again. So Joe started off with the example of, of Gambia. And I think uh, a stark contrast to the Gambian election is the election that occurred in Ghana just a few days apart. So, you know, while they both ended up, uh, I would say, with a peaceful transfer of power, one more protracted than the other, that's really where the similarities um, stop. You know, the, the two countries couldn't be more different in terms of um, institutions, um, in terms of their um, uh, where they are on their um, political transition. Uh, sorry, democratic uh, transition. And it's that stark difference can really um, be amplified to the continent. Uh, today, every country except Eritrea holds elections. But that's really where that, that you know, similarity ends. Uh, if you dig uh, deeper, as you all know, the, you know, the countries are very different. Um, and the pace and progress of de uh, democratization is as varied as the countries themselves. So I'll start with a few things. I want to talk about um, uh, political rights and civil liberties and, and where, we, um, uh, where the, con the continent has, has progressed. And I'd like to start at 1990. That is typically where um, uh, political scientists will mark the beginning of the democratization process on the continent. And in 1990, there were four countries that were considered free. Free in terms of um, political rights and free in terms of civil liber uh, liberties. It's only four countries, so I'll name them. Uh, Botswana, Gambia, Mauritius, and Namibia. If you fast forward to today, um, a little over a quarter of a century later, Gambia is no longer among those four countries, but the number of countries have jumped from four to nine. So we've just had a five country increase in the number of countries that are considered uh, free in terms of political rights and, and civil liberties. And those countries are Benin, Cape Verde, Ghana, uh, Santo Tome and Principe, Senegal, South Africa, and then of course the three from 1990, Mauritius, uh, Namibia, and Botswana. The rest of the continent is divided between being partly free or not free at all. <coughs> And that has been pretty stable. There's been very little movement. So the question is, you know, why, that's, why that is happening. Uh, yesterday we heard from Paul Williams about governance. And one of the things that he mentioned was that um, for about the last 15 years or so, governance has either um, stalled or gotten worse on the continent. And we see that at many different um, indicators. The Mo Ibrahim Foundation, I'm sure many, perhaps you've heard of the Mo Ibrahim Prize, and that's the prize that is given to an African um, head of state that has left office after serving his term and um, has been uh, assessed by the Mo Ibrahim <coughs> Foundation to um, have exemplified you know, the highest levels of, of good governance. They also um, track, have been tracking governance on the continent for the past decade, and uh, since, since 2007. So 2017 was a, a big year for, the, for a, a retrospective on how far the continent has come. And their indicators show that the continent as a whole has moved up one point on governance. There are a number of countries that have done much better than that, of course, but there have also been a number of countries that have um, gone backwards. As Joe mentioned, what we are seeing is 
you know, a few steps forward and then some backsliding. There's been great, but there's also some good news within that. There's been a very good um, improvement on the, um, in the categories of political participation. So we see that, that um, uh, people are able to participate politically. And human rights has improved. But unfortunately, the biggest um, step back has been in the area of safety and um, and uh, observance of the rule of law. So the types of um, questions about human security that we've spent the last few days talking about um, has actually seen a step back uh, in the next uh, in the last uh, ten years. And then on the Mo Ibrahim Prize, the this year or in 2017, they did not award a um, a prize for 2016. And it's the second year in a row. The last, pres the last president, past president, to receive a prize was President Pohamba of Namibia in 2014. And so they don't, you know, they don't feel obligated to, to give a prize if there's no need to, to do so. So that was, uh, so it was decidedly a very mixed year. But what do people, what do Africans say? You know, how do they support democracy? And here we have very good news. There is great support for democracy in Africa. And here uh, I look at something called the Afrobarometer, which has been tracking public opinion um, in Africa for the last 10 years or so. And more than two thirds of Africans <coughs> support democracy. Perhaps ironically, the highest level of support for democracy is in Burundi um, at 86%, the highest uh, on the continent. And along with that, about 80% reject dictatorship or uh, one party rule. So at the, at the ground level, there is great support for democratic norms and institutions but we're not seeing that um, uh, at the sort of leadership um, leadership level. So this is sort of the context in which political transition and elections have been taking place um, on the continent. There are a few countries where, uh, a few countries like Ghana, Senegal, Mauritius, South Africa, where civil liberties are um, well respected, where, where politicians um, can engage in politics freely, um, and where all of these stakeholders operate re with relative ease. But the majority, uh, most, of, most of the countries, we don't have that. It's a very mixed um, environment with very limited freedom um, to exercise political rights and enjoy um, civil liberties. What are some of the key institutions that sort of determine um, how this context uh, plays out? The judiciary, the security sector, um, the electoral commission, when we're talking about um, elections. All of this work against making elections predictable events. Not predictable in the sense that we know who might win. Um, sometimes we know that off the bat. But predictable in the sense that we will have an election, we'll go home and wait for the result, and we'll go on with our lives the next day. In, most, in many countries, um, there is a lot of tension around that, um, around that period. I, w I want to switch now and talk a little bit more deeply um, um, about elections and, and what we know about how they've transpired um, over the last uh, 25 um, years or so. So uh, there's, uh, I've worked with um, uh, a professor at, uh, at the University of Wisconsin named Scott Strauss. Paul Williams mentioned him yesterday. And um, all together, there have been 295 presidential and parliamentary elections from 1990 
to 2014 in Africa. So we just take that set um, of elections. And um, what we find is that 59% of elections have had some type of violence, all the way from low-level intimidation and harassment to the more intense violence that we have seen in Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, um, Nigeria. 41% have had no violence at all in that, in that great span of time. And even though the, 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 the balance is you know, more on the, on the violence part, the good news in that, in, in that basket is that the, the very intense types of violence, the ones that we actually do hear about, happens in about 9%. And a lot of it um, might be post-election violence. So we find that if violence does take place, post-election violence, uh, such as Cote d'Ivoire in Kenya, Republic of Congo, is much more intense, but it is not the most common. Mostly, citizens on the continent are subjected to the type of violence that we find in intimidation and harassment that cause a lot of the, um, a lot of the fear. Um, why do we see these trends? Why hasn't, why after 25 years um, do we keep seeing this? And actually, if you were to map all of that out, you would not see that violence starts, you know, high in 1990 and decreases. You see that it is ongoing. There's actually been no change. So that tells us a few things. One is that um, if there's, we, we have not seen what we might call institutional learning. So the more often that um, countries might put on um, elections, the better that they get. We have not actually seen that. We still see a persistence um, of violence um, uh, on, on the continent. So the hope of democracy that political transitions might be less violent actually has not been, um, been realized. We're trying to understand why we keep seeing um, violence. One thing we know is that most of the violence, 95% of it, occurs before the election. And so these are efforts to try to change the outcome. And as I said, if post-election violence does occur, it's actually much more um, much more deadly. We know that close elections um, coupled with institutional weakness might cause, um, might, might cause a, more violence. Impunity um, is also a reason to worry. We also know that um, the past matters. So countries that have had um, violent transitions are more prone to having violent transitions um, in the future. And um, countries exiting, uh, exiting conflict, post-conflict countries, those, have, those are also particularly prone, especially if demobilization doesn't occur. And maybe that sounds um, like a, uh, a uh, Counter sounds very intuitive, but so many, so often, uh, demobilization and disarmament doesn't actually occur. We saw that, or doesn't actually occur sufficiently. We saw that in the DRC, for example, where you know if you still have the capacity to contest an election violently, it will it will happen. So I just want to um, mention about four. The four different cases that we've seen in the last year or so, just to draw out these contrasts. Um, Benin, in, at the beginning of 2016, even though this was a hotly contested um, election, and there were worries that Yaya um, uh, uh, Bunny 
might attempt to change the Constitution or might, for a third term. Uh, what we actually saw was civil society, the business community, um, really forcefully opposing that. And in fact, they voted his um, political party out of office um, out of, uh, in the parliamentary elections. And so that capacity to change the Constitution um, no longer existed. And he came out public, publicly and said he would not seek a third term. So here we see institutions and stakeholders actually doing what they um, are supposed to do. Ghana, at the end of the year, in 2016, it was also a competitive election, not entirely peaceful. Uh, we saw um, a number of serious violent clashes um, many months before the election, and that was due to institutions um, uh, that were uh, suspected to be uh, biased, non-credible, and so you saw um, the opposition reacting to that, not actually believing that the institutions were going to do what, uh, what they were supposed to do. Uh, as we got closer, I think that the, you know, the judiciary and the electoral commission, which were very heavily compromised before, took significant steps to improve, and there was a lot of diplomatic pressure, and um, that eventually, I think, resulted in a peaceful transition. So in both Ghana and Benin, you see that um, the power of institutions can actually um, help in getting a, um, a peaceful transition. And they're also unique. We don't often see a turnover, especially in the, in the Ghanaian case. We don't often see um, incumbents being voted out of office. Uh, there was an interesting article in the Mail and Guardian, which is a South African paper, that said that um, since the end of colonialism, or since, so, since independence, only 19 African incumbent leaders from 11 countries have been voted out of office. So that's the, that's the power of being an incumbent um, in, in the African context. You, you, you have a high chance of retaining your position. In the middle of the year, we had Gabon in, 20, uh, in 2016. Um, and they, Gabon fa fared much worse than Benin and, <coughs> and Ghana. Ali Bongo was um, not, uh, there was no third term controversy, but that's because they've removed um, term limits uh, from the constitution. But the opposition argued that, you know, they still didn't have confidence in the institutions that were supposed to manage these elections. Um, they would not believe the, the results that came out at, or to, um, they would not um, believe the judiciary if they had to contest, contest those results. And so what we saw was almost predictable. The announcement um, of the announcement by the Electoral Commission that Ali Bongo won was quickly followed by very violent and deadly protests. Um, in the capital, and they continued um, for some time um, after that. And then um, finally, the most lethal case uh, we've seen uh, uh, recently is Burundi in 2015. And here we had um, Pierre Nguranziza vying for a very controversial first, uh, third term. And it hinged on whether or not the Arusha Peace Accords actually allowed him you know, to run for that third term. On one side, you had the opposition and really the rest of the, the international community insisting that he step down, but the um, Electoral Commission and ju the judiciary sided with him, which was seen as very biased by the opposition. And what we saw um, leading up to the elections and in the aftermath was very violent confrontation. Hundreds um, killed, um, you know, hundreds of thousands displaced, and that instability um, continues today. So just to take you through, you know, these very varied, um, varied ways in which we, we're seeing um, political transitions happen, and the key, the key factor in all of these are how credible the, institu the institutions are. Um, 
but elections aren't the only way we, are, we keep seeing political transitions. Coups d'etat, coup d'etats are still occurring on the continent. Um, and if you look at all the data, you see that they, are, they actually continue to occur with the same frequency that they did since 1990. And that's about, on average, one successful coup a year and about seven or eight attempted coups every year. In 2000, the African Union had a new constitutive act um, where they would not recognize unconstitutional forms of government. It's commonly referred to as the ban on coups. But actually, when you look at the data, that has not happened. Coups are still happening at the same rate even after the so-called ban on coups. So we still see this very strong persistence of violent political contestation on the continent, and trying to understand that is a, is a huge challenge. So let me, I'll just conclude here um, with just a few practical steps for security sector leaders or, or recommendations. Um, Joe has mentioned some of them, so I'll just emphasize that. The um, security institutions should not be politicized, uh, but not just security institutions. Security institutions working in tandem with other important institutions, whether it's the judiciary or the electoral commission or um, the media um, and other stakeholders, they should, uh, these Important, important institutions need to be seen as credible. Um, there are examples, Ghana, Senegal, where during elections, security institu institutions play a specific and um, specific role designed to uh, make the population feel less, uh, less threatened. There are other examples where security institutions engage um, with the community, where they are trusted institutions, where if you have a crime to report, your first call is not to the community leader, might be, but it is actually to the police because you have faith in that. One, they will come to your aid, and two, they might do something to help you. Um, and so working on that is important. Um, in 2007, 2008, I think the continent was shocked by what happened um, in Kenya after those, the elections there. There was a subsequent uh, review that's called the Waki Report, and one of the things they found was that 30% of the 1,500 people that died were actually killed at the hands of police. And so after that, there was a big push for um, police reform. So that's an important uh, indicator for how um, critical the security institutions are in terms of how they engage with the um, with the community. They must be seen for as working with people and not against them. And then finally, what's the price that politicians and others pay for advocating violence? If the cost is low and the benefits are higher, then violence becomes a viable strategy. In 2013, I uh, was in Kenya about a, a month or so before the elections, and there was a lot of fear about what the um, International Criminal Court would do. And it was a very palpable fear. Um, there was censorship about hate speech and um, making sure that, um, you know, that the type of the conditions that led to the violence in 20 in 2007 were not present um, because it was unclear you know what would what would happen would would the politicians be prosecuted for advocating violence um, so if there are consequences and some countries do have um, courts to deal with electoral offenses if there are consequences that makes a difference and whether or not violence is a viable strategy. Um, and so working um, with the judiciary, the electoral commission, to make sure that calls to violence, hate speech, 
use of vigilantes, um, other conditions that um, make violence a much easier strategy, making sure that those conditions don't exist are important roles for the security um, uh, sector. So I'll end there. Thank you.